Abadar Flint's Lost Treasure Prologue Myths and Legends Tales of adventure, magic, and the marvels of the realm Used to entertain friends and family And to distract the fearful from the darkness beyond the fires of home To most, those stories remain exactly that Stories There are, however, a few who believe in them and that belief turns the stories into a guiding light for their future. They spend the rest of their lives chasing after smoke and mirrors, spending so long living inside their own fantasies that they block out the wonders of the real world. Until one day, reality comes crashing down around them. Chapter 1. The Well in the land of Irona, the sun is high in the sky and baking the land with its heat. Along the cliffs, the salty sea air blows in the faces of the free riders on horseback as they make their way down a beaten, muddy path across a grassy field. The trio is led by an adventurer, Drake, his scruffy beard matching his wild, dark brown hair. On top of his dark red shirt, is a simple earth-brown coat that extends down to his knees, where his grey trousers are covered in dirt. To his right is Kriya, his beloved, carrying a bow over her moss-green coat and white shirt. Bringing up the rear is his closest friend Charles, an overweight man with his mud hair flowing down either side of his face, stopping at his blue fur cloak. They are looking for the hidden treasure of Abadar Flint, a famous pirate whose treasure has never been found. According to legend, part of his treasure was an amulet that prevented death. The story says he's still alive, spending eternity with his treasure. They have not encountered another soul for miles, and yet, off in the distance, a small dot slowly transforms into another figure on horseback. Do not worry. Let me do all the talking. I'll handle this. You sure? You talking normally gets us into trouble. Name one time. The tavern in Grutos. The roots of the forest. That guy Saladon. Those pirates. The tavern in- You mentioned the tavern. I was talking about another tavern. So there might have been one time, but think of the countless times I've gotten us out of danger. <laughs> <laughs> As the figure riding towards them gets into focus, Drake pulls on the reins, bringing his horse to a stop, and the others follow his lead. The figure turns out to be an elderly man, with a weathered face and balding head of snowy white hair, matching his horse. The rider is wearing a navy cloak with a badge sewn on his right breast of his simple black tunic. The badge is a blood-red eye on a field of white. The horse stops in front of the trio without needing any instructions. Good day to you, fine folks. May I be of some assistance? Thank you for your kind offer, but we're heading to Orshore. Not much of a difficult journey, just following the path. Indeed. This path takes you straight there. What brings you on your journey? Anything we're able to help you with? No, no. I'm the Night Watchman. It's my job to patrol this road. Ah, uh, but it's the middle of the day. Yes, my son normally patrols at this time. However, he is unable to today. Might I ask your names? My name's Drake. My companions here are Kriya and Charles. We're heading to Orshore to find passage onto our next destination. Ah, Orshore is a lovely town. I'm proud to call it my home. I would highly recommend staying there for a few days. The inn known as the Silver Goblet is a good place if you're looking for accommodations. I'll let you get on your way. Enjoy the remainder of your ride. Oh, my friend. Before you go, any chance you know of a well around here? We will need to refill our water skins soon. Uh, there is a well nearby. Unfortunately, no one has been able to get water from it in... Well, longer than anyone can remember. Nobody uses it anymore. It's more of a landmark than anything. It shouldn't be a problem, though. Orshore's not that far. Good day. Farewell, and look after yourself. 
Hope you don't run into any rogues. <laughs> you should hope the rogues don't run into me. I can take care of myself. Drake waits until the rider is out of earshot before turning to Kriya and Charles. <laughs> now we know where the well is. Why didn't you ask him his name? He asked Owls, it's only polite. I was more focused on the well. You heard him. Nobody uses it. He even described it as a landmark. Kriya gives Drake a look, making him feel guilty. Okay, well, why didn't you ask his name? You told us to let you do the talking. Yeah, you said you would handle it. Well, I did. See? Countless times. It's not really countless. It's more like one. <laughs> <laughs> Our trio continue along the mud path until they come across the well. Drake jumps off his horse and starts sprinting across the grass towards the well. Charles grabs the reins of Drake's horse and, with Kriya, ties them up at a nearby tree before joining Drake. The ancient stone slightly crumbles into his palm as he looks down into the abyss. Here, sweetie. Drake looks over to Kriya, who has a torch in one hand and flint in the other. Drake takes the torch from her while she sets it alight. Drake holds the flaming torch over the entrance to the abyss and lets go. The flame grows smaller and smaller until it's barely a flicker. So how are we getting down there? Uh, narrow with jagged edges. You definitely won't be able to fit. A point taken. Kriya, you're the smallest of all of us. She's not going down. She's been sick for a few days now. I should be able to fit. Looks like I get to have all the fun. Let's get a move on before someone comes along. Time to see if that information was worth the coin. Drake stands at the edge of the well, in a harness made from rope, a bone dagger in his right hand. The rope continues, wrapping around a tree and onto a horse's saddle. Charles holds the horse by its reins, waiting for Drake to make his first move. Ready, Drake? You know me. Drake puts the bone dagger in his mouth and jumps off the well, descending down. Drake is soon consumed by the darkness, unable to see anything. The well is small and tight. Jagged rock squeezes up to Drake, ripping a couple of buttons off his coat. Drake's boots touches the floor to discover not a single drop of water. Drake gets out of the harness and picks up the torch he dropped in his left hand while holding his bone dagger in his right. The torch lights up, revealing a cavern filled with treasure. <laughs> I knew it was a landmark. Drake starts slowly walking around the treasure, taking in his discovery. At one end of the room, a skeleton lies on the floor in rotting clothing. The skeleton is covered in treasure, Pockets full of coins falling out of the holes, golden teeth, jewellery around his neck, and a bright sapphire ring on his finger. Drake walks over to the skeleton and bends down, picking up the hand and removing a golden ring with the blue sapphire from the skeleton's finger. Drake carefully examines the ring between his thumb and index finger. Ah, perfect. Drake puts the sapphire ring in his pocket, and starts making his way back towards the road. He goes up to an open, overflowing chest full of gold coins. Drake picks up a handful and slowly lets them fall between his fingers. I'll be back for you. Drake ties the harness back around him and tugs on it three times. The rope starts lifting him back up out of the well. Nothing's down there. Really? Nothing? Not even water. It's just a dried up well. Sweetie, what happened to your coat? Huh? Oh, this? It's nothing. A few jagged rocks on the way down. It's only buttons. <laughs> I'll fix your coat later. Thanks. So what are we meant to do now? According to the journal, they did make a final stop. They could have hidden the treasure around there. We'll have to go to Heberux and head north. No, we'll head to Orshore and make our way from there. Why? Heberux will be quicker. Yes, however, we told that guy we were heading to Orshore. We don't want to draw attention to ourselves. If we're not there, he might think we got lost and come looking for us. We're after a long lost treasure. Last thing we need is people following us. Drake, sweetie, that doesn't really make sense. Just because that night watchman won't see us, doesn't mean we're in danger. He won't be looking out for us in Orshaw. Don't you agree, Charles? Kriya turns her back to Drake and faces Charles. 
Charles looks towards Drake, who gives him a wink. Best not to risk it. Let's get the horses ready. Charles goes over to the horses, while Drake pulls Kriya to the side. Look, it might not make much sense to you, but you just have to trust me on this. You're really stubborn, you know that? My stubbornness has helped out a lot. One of these days it's going to get us into some real trouble. I hope so. That's where the fun lives. Stay here. I'll get your horse for you, my lady. Thank you, my lord. Drake kisses Kriya on the forehead and joins Charles at the horses. Drake, I trust you. You know I will follow you anywhere. Can I at least know what the plan is? We can't go to the next location. Why is that? Is the treasure somewhere else? This isn't about the treasure. It's something much more important. Drake pulls the ring out of his pocket, careful to keep it hidden from Kriya. I'm going to ask Kriya to marry me. I want to ask her in Stromall. That's why we need to go to Orshore. Congratulations, Drake. Now put that thing away before she sees. Drake slips the ring back in his pocket and takes his and Kriya's horse over to her. Drake, there's, um, there's something I need to tell you. Which is? I've been trying to find the right moment for it. I thought finding the treasure would be the best time, but it's probably best if I just say it. I'm pregnant. <laughs> That's fantastic. Congratulations, you two. Drake, where are we going to raise it? Can't raise a baby while we go around hunting for lost treasure. We need to find a house. A home. Oh, I... Um... Guess we got a lot to do. I thought you already had a house. The one in Oasis. Well, I should. I never went back to claim it. Surely the king would still have a place for you. He wouldn't go back on an agreement. Okay. After we go to our next destination, we'll head over to Oasis. You helped the king out before. He could help you with a job. You could be a ranger. You've got the traveling skills. I'm sure we'll find this treasure. Then we'll have all the money we need to give our child the perfect life. Always have a backup plan, Drake. Fine. If we don't find the treasure, I'll go to the king. And that could be our new life. A peaceful one raising our child. And Charles here can continue exploring the realm. Do you really think I would keep going without my two best friends? I'm staying with you. I'll be a ranger with you. Hell, I'll sleep at a hay pile outside your house. <laughs> Do you really think you could leave a life of adventure behind and settle down for a simple life? If you can, I can. I'm with you till the end. Right. Well, let's go. The three of them saddle up and begin to ride off towards Orshaw. Chapter 2 The Silver Goblet Drake, Kreia, and Charles arrive in Orshaw just before sunset. The portcullis rises up above their heads, allowing them passage through. Orshaw is known for its circular walls, one on the outside and several on the inside, separating the different sections of the town. Everything is contained inside the walls, except for the docks, which lie on the outside but still shut off. The only way to access the docks is from sea or through Orshaw itself. The trio have found a stable to look after their horses and are now walking down the cobbled street, taking in their surroundings. The street is filled with people, slowly returning home from a day's labor and the market beginning to close down for the night. Let's stay here tonight and get a ship tomorrow morning. Come on, let's look for that inn. Overflowing goblet. No, it was the silver goblet. No, I want an overflowing goblet of ale. Tell you what, I'll find a ship for us and meet you two at the inn. Are you sure you'll be able to find us? Oh, come on, Kriya. Give Charles a bit of credit. It's an inn with ale and food. Of course Charles will be able to find it. Ha! Come here, Drake. Charles grabs Drake away from Kriya, embracing him in a hug. Secretly to whisper, so Kriya can't hear them. If I get the passage, it will be easier to hide it from Kriya. Don't worry, Drake. I got your back. Thank you. Charles starts strolling off down a street towards the docks, leaving Drake and Kriya. Any idea how we can find the inn? Kriya turns around towards a short man with long, wild black hair and a bald spot on his crown, currently in the middle of a conversation with a man wearing rags. I'm not lying to you. The egg is as big as my head. I, I can sell it to you for a price. Sorry to interrupt. Any chance you two know of an inn called the Silver Goblet? Yeah, we know the place. Great. Could you tell us how to get there? You wouldn't want to be going there if I was you. Oh, really? Why is that? It's not the best of places you want to go into. You should try the Salty Sea. Oh, come on, clan. 
Look, he owns the Salty Sea. No one goes in there because Clan here has awful ales. He's unfriendly to his customers. He's kind of a- No, enough of that. There's nothing wrong with my establishment. Yes, there is. <laughs> We've all had enough. I'm not buying the egg, and these two won't be spending a penny. Now beat it. Aha. I've had enough of this. Clan storms down the street in a mood that won't be disappearing anytime soon. Uh, sorry to kind of put you in the middle of that. I'll take it to the Silver Goblet. The stranger nods his head in the direction Clan left in and starts leading the way, as Drake and Kriya follow. Anyway, my name is Rumet. That other guy was Clan. Clan is... no one likes him. No matter how he's supposed to still be in business, he's alienated everyone from Warshore. Silver Goblet, much nicer place to stay. How long you plan on staying? Just the night. Gotta get on a ship tomorrow. Ah, where are you heading? To Trago. What's in Trago for you two then? Um... Sorry, I forgot your name. Bit bad, I know. <laughs> it's... it's Rumen. Rumen. I'll try to remember that. I'm guessing you live here? Yeah. Whole life. Never complained. However, I gotta admit, I got a craving to see more of the realm. My sister got to go off with her husband and start a family. Unfortunately, her husband and children died. She should be arriving here any day now. But it wasn't that detailed. Haven't seen her in a while. Oh, I'm so sorry. How did they die, if you don't mind me asking? No, not at all. Although, I don't know what happened. Never said in a letter. Ah, here we go. Silver Goblet. Ruman stops in his tracks and raises his right arm towards the sign above the inn's door. A silver goblet on a field of red with a blackened metal border around the sign. Come on in and enjoy the silver goblet. Ruman enters through the front door, closely followed by Drake and Kriya. The silver goblet is packed, full of customers laughing and telling stories, all with an ale in hand. A musician sits in the corner, bringing yet more life into the room. Like I said, no one goes into the Salty Sea, so everyone comes here instead. Do you think he'll have a spare room? Ah, of course he will. Most of these people here live in Orshore. I'll introduce you to Parkin. Ruman leads the way, pushing past the crowds towards the bar, followed by Drake and Kriya. Ruman taps his hands on the counter. Oh, Parkin! A man in his late forties emerges from the cellar behind the bar, wearing an apron. He looks like he's half-giant, much bigger than a normal human. Parkin has a bald head, but a great big bushy beard, black as coal, reaching down to his torso. He folds his tree-trunk arms and stares at Rumin, before a massive grin appears on his face. Ho ho! Rumon! Good to see you, young friend. Ha <laughs> ha! It's good to see you too, and I've told you. It's Rumen. Yes, Rumon. It's... Close enough. How you been, Parkin? Busy, busy, busy. Lots of happy customers. Good times, always. Good, the way it should be. Anyway, I've got two people looking for a room. Actually, three people looking for two rooms, just for one night. Three silvers per person, per night. Done. Kriya reaches into her bag and places the money into Parkin's massive hands. Thank you, kind lady. We could have tried talking him down. You don't want to do that. Parkin here is a good guy. He's always trying to help. If you think his prices aren't a good deal, he takes it personal. Yes, I do. Sorry about that. No offense meant. No problem at all. Just make sure to listen to nice lady here. Trust me, she doesn't give me a choice. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, please. I must now make dinner. How much for some dinner? We haven't eaten since this morning. Dinner in price, big communal feast. Meet new people, tell stories, good times. Parkin strides off towards the kitchen, leaving the trio behind. An attractive barmaid with a blonde ponytail walks over, taking Parkin's place. Anything to drink? Well, that is one of the reasons why we have come to this fine inn. I've told you before, Ruman. I'm not having a drink with you. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. The other reason why we're here is to get a room for these two. Now, 
I believe you were talking about our drink? Yes, I'll pour you a drink since it's my job. The barmaid turns her head towards Drake and Kriya. What can I get for you? Your finest ale. And water, please. Coming right up. The barmaid turns her head, making sure her ponytail flicks across Ruman's face. His mouth turns into a massive grin, and his hazel eyes continue watching her make their drinks. How long has it been going on for? Doesn't matter. I know we'll never be together. No one else around here I like, and eh, it's fun. Here you go. The barmaid places their drinks onto the table. I've already put that on your tab, Ruman. Ah, thank you, fair maiden. Oi, get your hands off me. From further down the bar, a figure in a navy cloak pins a peasant in rags onto the bar. The figure forces the peasant onto her feet, causing his hood to fall off, revealing the weathered face of the watchman. The watchman makes his way down the bar with the peasant, towards Drake. Done nothing wrong, I swear. One of these days, I will catch you red-handed. The watchman notices Drake and Kriya. Ah, glad you took my advice. Pleasure meeting you two again. Where's your friend? He's gone off towards the docks. The peasant tries escaping, but the watchman pulls her back, tightening his grip, causing the peasant more pain. Oh, too doy. Just wait till you arrive at the pit. What? Please don't. Anything but there. Well, you broke the law. This is what you get. The law is the law. Looks like you were right. You can take care of yourself. Haha. <laughs> Hopefully I won't have to be going after you two. Now, please excuse me. I need to take her to the cells. Lucky for you, the next prison wagon is leaving at sundown. Please, I'll do anything. Come on, you two. Let's head over to the table for dinner. The watchman forces the peasant through the crowd of people and out of the tavern. Ruman leads Drake and Kriya away from the bar towards the back of the tavern. They go through a door leading to a separate room with a long oak table set up with plates and cutlery. Are you going to be eating as well? Oh yeah, Parkin won't mind. Uh, don't sit at the head of the table, that's, uh, that's Parkin's place. The three of them sit down at the table, next to a group of eight other people. Drake makes sure to leave a spot next to him for Charles. Chapter 3 The Feast At the table, the other guests give the trio a curious look. Further down the table next to Ruman sits a husband and wife with their child. A girl, no older than ten. On the opposite side of the table, right at the end, a man sits alone. He's wearing a black cloak, with the hood up hiding his face. A single glow can be seen under his hood, where he lights his pipe. Directly opposite Drake sits a group of four friends. Two men, and two ladies. So, how is everyone? Everyone at the table looks at Drake in complete silence. Kriya pats Drake on the shoulder. You did the best you could, sweetie. I'm Kriya, please forgive my partner, Drake. Partner? Kriya gives Drake a look, before turning back to the rest of the table. We've just found out I'm pregnant, so yeah, he's my partner. The husband further down the table leans forward to make himself seen, a man in his late forties. He has a slim face, with a long nose and short black hair, with signs of him slowly going grey. Congratulations, my name is Galrif. This here is my lovely wife, Helena. It's a pleasure to meet you. And this is our daughter, Freakin. Raising a child is a wonderful thing. I wish you two the best of luck. Thank you. Kriya turns her attention to the group of people directly opposite them. And what are your names? The group of friends opposite look the same age as Drake and Kriya. One of the men, with long blonde hair but shaved sides, blue eyes and a necklace with a dragon symbol, raises his hand. My name is Thomas. This here is Kel. Thomas points to the woman sitting next to him. Her blonde hair tied back into a ponytail, her brown eyes studying Drake and Kriya. Up next is Vargas. Next to Kel, a bald man with a thick black moustache nods his head. Pleasure to meet you. Next to Vargas, a woman with a pointy nose and long, sharp nails painted black points at Thomas. I can speak for myself, Tommy. She sharply turns her head towards Drake and Kriya. From underneath her green hair, her eyes, one red, one blue, fix on Drake and Kriya. My name is Jewel. Who's your friend here? 
she points directly at Rumin, while her mixed matched eyes unblinkingly stay on Drake and Kriya. I'm Rumen. I'm a friend of Parkin. I helped Drake and Kray find the place. Oh, uh, my sister might come down later on. Her ship should be arriving soon, so hopefully she'll join us. She used to live in Saxondale, but her family died, so she's coming back to live with our parents. You still live with your parents. Nope, just live in the same village. But thanks for jumping to conclusions, though. Rumin turns towards the unknown figure at the end of the table. Last one. Who are you? The hooded figure looks away from Rumin and looks down at the table. He keeps to himself. Parkin enters the room carrying a massive pot with steam rising from the top. Feast is ready. Hope you all have empty bellies. From behind Parkin, two barmaids follow, carrying more trays of food, placing them on the oak table. Parkin places a massive pot in the center and sits at the head of the table. Let us begin. Everyone starts putting food on their plates. They begin eating and talking among their separate groups. The unknown figure eats in silence while looking at his plate. At the end of the feast, there's still plenty of food on the table, but everyone's stomachs are full. Parkin turns towards Kriya. So, nice lady, what do you two do? Oh, we go around the realm looking for lost treasure. The table drops into complete silence, and everyone has stopped what they were doing and are now fixed on Drake and Kriya. <laughs> a life of adventure. You two are adventurers? <gasps> well, there's three of us. Our friend Charles is off looking for a ship. But yes, well... That beats our lives as farmers. <laughs> You've raised a family. Nothing can beat that. Well, right now we're going to Oasis to raise our child. To me, that sounds like the best adventure of all. Tommy, Vargas, you two planning on having children with your ladies? It's Thomas. Only friends can call me Tommy. Okay, sore spot, got it. We're just friends. These aren't our ladies. And these aren't our men. Thanks for jumping to conclusions, though. Tell us about your adventures. Whoa, freaking! Be polite. He's not here to be telling us stories. But how does he know where to go? It's fine, Galreef. Sometimes you just go around exploring the realm. Now with the myths and legends, you have to do your research. Look for information, hints, and locations. You need to separate the fact from fiction. Not everything is real, though. The Caves of Penance? It's a myth that somewhere in the realm there's a cave that makes you face your fears. Well, face yourself and who you've become. Myth has it, the cave feeds on people. Only those unable to face their sins. That's a complete myth. No fact in there. Somewhere in the realm. No evidence. I want to do that when I grow up. Go off and become an adventurer. Listen here. You might have big dreams about fighting monsters and finding gold. Don't get me wrong, those are fun. Look here. Drake gets up and shows Freecan a scar on the back of his right ankle. Fighting living skeletons. Oh, piss off. Like that ever happened. You don't have to believe me. Drake turns towards Freecan. But it's true. Anyway, having adventures are fun, but there is so much more to life. Drake moves his hand onto Kriya's stomach. At the end of the day, you gotta make sure you're happy. Look around us. This is what life is all about. Spending time with others, the people you love, making a difference no matter how small. Drake looks into Kriya's purple eyes. Finding the one person who makes you whole. Aw, oh, come on, Drake. Kriya will start to get jealous of us. Drake and Kriya turn around to see Charles walking into the room. He sits down at the table, grabbing the massive pot and starts shoveling food into his mouth. Everyone is different. Not everyone is born for adventure. Listen to me, little lady. Doesn't matter who you are, what's happened to you, all that matters right now, making sure you do the right thing. The hooded figure rises from the table and takes his leave, not even thanking Parkin for the food. What was his problem? Unknown. Uh, we better be getting some sleep. Early rise tomorrow. I want to hear more stories. He's told you more than enough already. Let's go. We should go too. As they begin to leave, a woman in her early thirties enters, scanning the room. She's wearing a black blouse, with a red shirt and her black hair tied up into a bun. Her eyes have black veins, congregating towards the centre. Roman, 
There you are. Triff! Oh, so glad to see you again. Rumin jumps out of his seat and embraces Triff with a hug. How are you? Everything okay? Yeah, I'm good. I just got my closure. The gods kept me alive for a reason. Good to hear you're coping. Anyway, everyone, this is my sister Triff. We were just leaving. Jewel, Tommy, Vargas and Kel stand up from their chairs and make their way towards their rooms. Bye, Tommy. Why can't you be nice? I was nice to the child. I hope ours is like her. Gal Reef and his family make their way over towards the door. Gal Reef pats Drake on his shoulder. Congratulations again on the child. Having a child marks the beginning of a new era. Gal Reef nods his head as he walks past Triff. Helena embraces Triff with a hug. I am truly sorry for your loss. Don't be. This is what the gods wanted. Better go off to bed. You need rest. I'm not fragile. I know. I still like to look after you. Triff, the three who just left with Galreef, Helena, and Freecan. The half-giant over there is Parkin. Nicest man you'll ever meet. Pleasure. Drake and Kriya, met them today. Guy's still eating, it's their friend. Charles, nice to meet you all. This here is good food. Of course, I made it. Charles, you okay with us leaving? I have food. I'll be fine. Me, Ruman, and Tree will stay with Big Guy. Ha! Big Guy? <laughs> You're one to talk. Oh, Drake! Our ship leaves at midday tomorrow. It's called the Black Oak. Here is your key. Parkin reaches into a pocket on the inside of his apron and pulls out an iron black key and throws it over to Drake, who catches it in midair. Room 13. Good room for a kind lady. As for the big guy, I will give him his key when we are done. See you all in the morning. Drake and Kriya leave the table. Drake goes and gives a handshake to Rumen, while Kriya hugs Triff. Make sure you say goodbye before you leave tomorrow. Of course. Drake and Kriya exit the room and start walking up the stairs arm in arm, searching for their room for the night. I got something for you. Here. Kriya pulls out a white coin with a crescent moon symbol on the end of a chain. I found the coin when we were in Hebrax. Lost treasure and I thought of you. I made it into a necklace so you don't spend it by accident. Kriya reaches around Drake's scruffy hair and puts the necklace around his neck. Thanks, Kriya. I really am lucky to have found you. Give me your jacket. I'll fix the buttons before I go to sleep. I've got some with a unique symbol on them. The seller told me she didn't make any more like them. I'll change all of them, and you'll be the only person in the realm to have them. No, just do it in the morning. Let's just get some sleep. Never put stuff off, Drake. Chapter 4 The New Dawn <sighs> The sun has just begun to rise. A beam of sunlight from the window falls on Drake and Kriya who are curled up together in a small bed meant for one person. They would be savoring the moment if it wasn't for the banging at the locked door. What? We're trying to sleep. A guard dressed in shining armor and the yellow cloak of Orshaw storms into the room, followed by Clan. What's going on? We're checking everyone. Need to stop it from spreading. Stop what spreading? There, she's got it. Clan has his finger pointed at Kriya. Drake turns over to look at her, to discover black spots over Kriya's beautiful face. The guard and clan drag Kriya out of bed. Get off me! Hey, leave her alone! Drake, help me! We need to do this! Stop all of our short getting sick. As Kriya gets dragged away, she tries to escape with little success. Drake jumps out of bed and goes out onto the walkway. Looking down at the tavern, seeing more people with black spots being dragged outside, Drake sees Parkin with Jewel and rushes downstairs and over to them. Parkin! What's happening here? Where are they taking them? Even as Orshor has quarantined. People from Forest Gate have already arrived. We're sealed off, left to defend ourselves. So we're taking the people who are already infected and sealing them off in the inner town. Inner town? The town has a circular wall, but more on the inside. We're taking them to the inner circle. With any luck, the disease won't spread and the survivors will be let out. What about the people who are sick? What are we going to do for them? 
A couple of our healers are sick. They're already in there with medicine trying to find a cure. Parkin, where's Charles? A room where we had feast. Passed out from drinking. Drake turns and runs towards the room where they had the feast, avoiding the chaos that's unraveling in the tavern. Drake enters the room to find Charles asleep on the table, his blue fur cloak hanging over the chair, his boots on opposite ends of the room. He is, however, still holding on to his goblet. Charles! Charles, wake up! Drake grabs a goblet of water and pours it out over Charles's face. <laughs> Charles, Kriya's been taken. What? I need you to pay attention. There's a disease. We've been quarantined inside Orshore. They're taking the sick to the inner circle. Kriya's been taken there. So what's going to happen to her? They've got healers doing their best to heal them. Problem solved. We just have to wait. Charles picks up a chicken leg from a plate that was left from the feast and starts lifting it up to his mouth before Drake slaps it out of his hand. I can't just stand around and do nothing. What if there's not enough medicine to go around? What if Kriya dies before they find a cure? We have to do something. Okay, do you know of a cure? Something we can find? No, but we could find someone to make a magical cure. We don't know anyone who could do magic. The amulet. The amulet of life? Yes, the treasure we were looking for. We don't know where it is. The well had nothing. No, no, no. It was full of treasure. I just wanted to get a ring for Kriya. The amulet has to be somewhere in the well. The amulet won't cure her. According to the stories, it only prevents death. Then she can keep it on forever. She'll still have the disease. She could pass it on to others. What kind of life is that? It will keep her alive until we can find a cure. I'm not letting her die. If we're quarantined in, then how can we get to the well? Charles, we're adventurers who travel the realm looking for lost treasure. Are you telling me a quarantine is going to stop you? Heh, <laughs> let's go. Charles jumps off the table and tries forcing his boots on. Charles begins running out of the room while putting his fur cloak on with Drake following. They emerge onto the street to find chaos. People dragging the sick towards the inner circle with their loved ones trying to stop them. We've got to help these people. And do what? I gotta save Kriya. You can help these people if you want. With you till the end. Drake and Charles start running towards the edge of town to find the portcullis shut and locked from the outside. Let's go over the wall. They run over to a tower and start climbing to the top of the walls. As they reach the top, they see someone else who had a similar idea, using a rope to try to escape. As he starts climbing over, an arrow hits him in the back, causing him to release his grip and plummet to the ground below. Oh, we've got to find another way. They'll kill us if they see us climbing down the walls. We don't have time. We won't climb down. We'll jump while holding the rope. Do it fast so they won't have time to aim. Drake dashes towards the rope without giving Charles chance to speak. Drake grabs the rope and leaps over, falling to the ground. His dark brown hair and jacket flapping in the wind as he watches the ground getting closer. The rope goes as far as it can and brings Drake to a stop just above the ground. Drake looks down to see the corpse of the man who tried to escape. Drake lets go of the rope, landing on the corpse and start sprinting towards the tree line while avoiding the arrows. Chapter 5 Witch Hunt Back inside Orshaw, the chaos has subsided. Anyone who has the disease is locked inside the inner circle. A group of people have gathered together outside the Silver Goblet. By the door, Rumen stands in his rags black trousers and a red shirt, with his hands on his hips, trying to address the crowd. All right, everyone, listen up. At some point during the night, people from Forest Gate arrived and have sealed us in. A disease has spread. We've taken everyone who's sick to the inner circle to prevent any more getting the disease. Healers are already there trying to find a cure. If anyone else gets ill, please go to the inner circle to help prevent others catching the disease. Please pass this along to everyone. How did Forest Gate know about the disease? I, I don't know. Clearly, someone told them. What are the symptoms? How do we know if someone is ill? So far, black spots and coughing blood. I've heard of those before. Everyone in the crowd turns towards a man wearing a black vest over a white shirt, green trousers, and a sailor's hat on top of his thick, curly ginger hair. He makes his way towards the front, 
so everyone can hear him. Where from? A village called Saxondale, near Crown Rock. How do you know that? I'm a sailor. I hear news on my travels. What happened to them? They had to burn the village. Everyone inside was already dead. Are they going to burn us as well? My wife and daughter have the disease. I got told they would be fine. Hold on. Saxondale, you... Jules' face, filled with vile, turns towards Rumen. She points her finger so everyone can turn to him. You told us your sister just arrived from Saxondale last night. You said her entire family died. Can't be. Everyone in Saxondale died. Apart from your sister, who else survived? No one. Just her. How can that be? The gods wanted her to live. Bullshit. She's the only survivor before, and now as soon as she arrives, we get the disease. She's a witch. I think this is going to your head. You heard the sailor. They burned Saxondale. If we don't do something, they'll burn Osha. With all of us still trapped inside. What should we do? We burn the witch. Killing her will end the curse. You're not burning my sister. We grew up here. Most of you know her. She, she's not a witch. It's her or us. If it saves my family, I'll help. Jewel looks around to see most of the crowd nodding their heads in agreement. Let's go find this witch. The crowd follows Jewel to go and hunt Trith. Rumen runs over to Parkin. Only the two of them are left on the street. Parkin, you gotta help me save Trith. We cannot change their minds. We need her out of town. On the edge of Orshaw, Drake has made it to the forest without getting injured. However, guards are close behind him. Drake has stumbled upon a father and son in the forest, who travel the realm selling goods. Drake has knocked them out to get their horses. As Drake removes the cart attached to the horses, he hears a noise behind him. He turns, drawing his sword, to see Charles hobbling from the bushes. You made it. I got down without a problem. They were aiming at you. Ah, took an arrow in the leg as I was trying to escape. I can't run anymore. Good thing I got us horses. Charles sees the father and son on the floor. What did you do? They're knocked out. They'll be fine. We need the horses more than they do. You don't know that! Come on, Charles. Drake jumps onto the black horse, and Charles climbs onto the white one, and they begin to ride off back to the well. Once they arrive, Drake jumps off his horse and goes running up to the well. Pass me the rope. Need to tie the horses up first. They need rest. Drake runs up to Charles and grabs the rope off him. Hey! You look after the horses, I'll get the amulet. Drake! Drake runs up to a tree and quickly ties the rope around it. He then returns to the well and without pausing, jumps down while gripping the rope. The rope comes loose from around the tree and follows Drake. Charles lets go of the reins of both horses and manages to grab the rope, saving Drake. While holding the rope with his hands, Charles makes his way back over and gets the horse's reins to prevent them from escaping. Inside the well, Drake has several cuts in his jacket from the rocks and a slightly bleeding cut on his right cheek. He begins to lower himself the rest of the way down to the cavern floor. He looks up to see a torch already lit. Standing next to the torch is a woman wrapped in a red cloak. Welcome, Drake. Uh, how do you know my name? Charles will call down to you soon, asking if you're alive. Who are you? I'm a seer. I can see the future. I saw I was meant to be here to give this to you. The seer's hand emerges from her cloak, holding the amulet. A golden circle with a jewel in the center that appears to contain a red liquid, similar to blood. Yes, I knew it was here. No, it was never here. I had to bring it with me. Drake! You're still alive? Yeah, Charles. Just a minute! Drake reaches out slowly, unsure of the woman, and takes the amulet. Why are you giving this to me? I told you. I saw me giving it to you. Yes, but why? 
I learned long ago. I can't change the things I've seen. The future will happen. It's all been planned. Easier to go along with it. We're all puppets. I can just see the strings. Now, go back to Orshaw, but remember this. These words you must remember. If you want to be free, embrace the cold. Drake looks at the seer, letting the words sink in, before he turns around and starts climbing back up the rope. As he reaches the top of the well, Charles pulls Drake out and onto the grass. They both lay on their backs, regaining their breath. Who are you talking to? No one. I got it, though. It exists. Drake holds the amulet up for Charles to see. It looks like... blood? I don't think this is such a good idea. Come on, back on the horses. We have to rescue Kriya. Drake rises to his feet, marching towards the horses. Charles slowly picks himself up, but stays rooted to the spot. Drake, the horses are tired. They need to rest. Stay here if you want. My family needs me. Chapter 6 Mercy Back outside Orshaw, Lord Victor Goldwell of Forestgate stands inside a yellow tent with his council. Inside the tent, everyone is gathered around a table, with a map of Irona spread out before them. Lord Victor Goldwell sits with his elbows at the table, fingers entwined under his golden goatee. What should we do? I heard of what Lord Sparrow had to do with Saxondale. He waited till everyone had died, though. We could wait it out and see if anyone does survive. We've already had people try to escape. Hmm, how many? Three. We killed one, but the other two escaped. We need to do something about them. I've already sent someone after them. He's not one of our men, but he wanted to help. He set out by himself. Right now, we need to focus on Orshore. There's been rumors that the survivor from Saxondale is inside Orshore. If that's true, then any survivors of this disease might carry the disease off to the next place. All right. I've thought about what has to be done. Sometimes the tough decision is the right decision. Inside Orshaw, Ruman is running down the streets, trying to find Triff. He hears a crowd marching a few streets away and starts making his way over to it. He reaches the edge, unable to see anything, so he climbs onto the balcony of a nearby house. He looks at the crowd to see the front has stopped outside a gate leading to the inner circle. At the front of the crowd is Jewel and Clan, who have both captured Trith. A small group of people have set a burning post in front of the gate. Open the gate! A few people go up to unlock the gate to the inner circle. As the doors open, a few infected look out, hoping a cure has been found. Nobody move! We still need to keep the infected separate. You won't be ill for much longer. We have the witch that brought this disease upon us. We'll burn her and the curse will be lifted! Jewel and Clan drag Triff over to the burning post, who struggles as they tie her to it. I'm not a witch. I didn't do anything wrong. The only reason that I survived is because the gods saved me. Please, somebody, believe me. Stop! From inside the inner circle, Kriya comes forward making herself known. You cannot be serious. It's only been a couple of hours and we're already at each other's throats. We have to stick together. We're doing this to save us. If you prevent this, you can burn as well. Jewel goes towards the crowd to collect a torch. Kriya stands in place, weighing her options, before running back into the inner circle out of sight. Ruman stands on the balcony, frozen in place, hands gripping the wooden post, unable to move. Just witness. Jewel brings the torch up to the pyre and drops it among the kindling. I dedicate this death to the gods. Please, no, no. The flame no. starts spreading all around no. her, trying to consume her. But out of nowhere, an arrow hits Trip in the heart, killing her instantly. Everyone looks in the direction where the arrow came from to see Kriya standing on a roof, 
holding an offshore guard's bow. Rumin breaks free of his trance, jumps down onto the ground and starts running towards the gate of the inner circle. Seize her! She stopped us from lifting the curse. Rumin makes it to the gate first, where he's able to close it behind him, with a few infected helping him bolt the gate, preventing the crowd on the outside getting in. Let us in. We demand the girl. You can try and get in if you want. However, chances are you'll get infected. Do you really want to risk that? The crowd thinks about this for a moment, and then start leaving the area as if they're all spooked. Inside the inner circle, Kriya comes up to Rumin and hugs him. I'm so sorry. I couldn't let her suffer. <sighs> no. No, you did the right thing. Thank you. Kriya releases Rumin from the hug, but her hands are holding onto his shoulders. Have you seen Drake? <sighs> no. Parkin told me he went after Charles earlier. What about Parkin? Is, is he alright? Should be. I went running off trying to find Triff. He couldn't keep up. He, he's somewhere out there now. Why did you lock yourself in with the rest of us? You'll catch this disease. They killed Triff. I didn't want them to kill anyone else. Chapter 7. Orshaw. Drake rides his exhausted horse as fast as he can back towards Orshaw. Determination in his eyes. Charles is nowhere to be seen, wanting to give his horse a rest first. In front of Drake, another rider is coming straight towards him. Drake's tired horse begins to slow down, unable to continue. Come on! Don't stop now! Drake's horse comes to a complete stop as the rider approaches, revealing himself to be the watchman from Orshaw. Drake jumps off his horse to greet the elderly man. Thank you! I'm so thankful you're here. I need your horse to get back to Orshore. It's good to hear you've had a change of heart. I'll need you to put the cuffs on first. What are you talking about? You and your friends tried escaping the quarantine. I've got to take you back to Orshore under command of Lord Victor Goldwell. If you survive, you'll go to the pit. Listen, my partner is pregnant. I need to get back to save her. If you wanted to help her, you wouldn't have left. Now. Put the cuffs on. I don't have time for this! Drake draws his sword with his right hand while still holding the amulet with his left. The watchman jumps off his horse and instinctively draws his in defense. I gave you the chance to return peacefully. I will kill you if I have to. <sighs> no, you won't. Death is on my side. Drake swings his sword at the watchman, who blocks every blow with little effort. The Watchman tries to get close to Drake to disarm him, but Drake struggles. The Watchman has his left hand gripped onto Drake's sword arm, while his right is holding his sword and gripping Drake's earth-brown coat. I told you I could take care of myself. Now I'm taking you in. Things will be easier for you if you- I'm sorry, but my family needs me. Drake pushes the elderly man off him and swings his sword. The Watchman rips a few buttons off Drake's coat with his right hand as he stumbles and turns. As he falls, his left hand tries to grip anything to support himself. He manages to grab hold of the amulet, stealing it from Drake's hand. Drake's sword keeps swinging towards him, striking his neck, removing the Watchman's head from his body in one clean swoop. Drake bends down and pries the amulet from the Watchman's left hand. You left me no choice! Drake puts the sword back into its scabbard and steals the watchman's horse. Drake leaves the decapitated watchman and continues back to Orshaw. As Orshaw comes back into focus, on the horizon, smoke as black as coal can be seen rising into the blue sky. Drake makes his way through the forest to avoid being detected, unable to see the smoke until reaching the tree line. Drake jumps off the watchman's horse and falls to his knees, dropping the amulet, as he witnesses the last of the flames that consumed Orshaw dying down. With a sense of time lost on Drake, Charles appears from behind, getting off his horse and tying it to a tree before trying to break Drake from his trance. Drake, I'm glad I found you. Listen, a few guards found the body of the Watchman and they're following the tracks back down here. He died with your buttons in his hand. We need to go. 
Drake's gaze remains fixed on the smoke, as if he heard nothing Charles said. Drake! If they catch you wearing this coat, they will send you to the pit! We need to move! Charles slaps Drake as hard as he can across the face. Where's your horse? Drake replies with silence, his eyes still fixed on the smoke. Charles looks in all directions, but is only able to see his. Come on, buddy. I'm with you to the end. Charles pulls Drake's coat off and throws it into a bush. He returns, forcing Drake onto his horse before also jumping on and riding off. Drake doesn't resist. As if all the fight has been drained out of him, they ride away from the destruction of Orshaw. Charles manages to escape with Drake to Forestgate and get passage on a ship to take Drake somewhere he needs to go. Charles is riding the white horse Drake stole from the father and son down a stone road with Drake sitting in front of him, looking dead inside. Listen to me, Drake. You have every right to be angry, sad, hell, every emotion there is. But you need help. You need closure. Her parents will be able to help you. Besides, they have a right to know. Everything is going to be fine. We're going to survive this. Epilogue. As Drake and Charles ride closer to Stromal, they discover this village, just like Orshaw, has been burnt to the ground. This act was committed by a group of raiders. Charles stops the horse, and both he and Drake look among the burnt ruins. Drake stumbles off the horse and slowly walks over, collapsing to his knees in the ash. Drake picks up a handful of ash and slowly lets it fall between his fingers. Charles gets off the horse and goes up to Drake, thinking of a way to comfort him. Unknown of what to say, Charles doesn't say anything and begins making camp for the night. Charles settles down to sleep while Drake continues looking at the ashes. Charles falls asleep completely unaware that that would be the last time he sees his closest friend, Drake. Oh, 